strength and power. To those with neither, the two often seem synonymous, but in reality, they couldn't be more different. Power, by its very nature, is limited and external. It's something one takes from the world through guile, intimidation, or simple luck, and jealously holds over the world to maintain that advantage. To share power is to diminish it, and there is nothing the weak and powerful fear more, so they must project a false image of strength while attacking any who challenge it or seek to empower themselves and others. True strength, by contrast, is something each and every one of us can cultivate within ourselves, and it only grows when shared. There's no easy path to true strength. The will to work for it is its most key component, but by the same token, it's not so easily taken away. Once attained, we can use our own strength to foster it within others, and the strength of our friends and comrades only multiplies our own. This dichotomy, the inherent conflict between those who crave or hold external power and those who seek inner strength, forms the backbone of basically all the great shonen battles. Kenshiro versus Rao, Goku versus Piccolo, Jojo versus Dio, Goku versus Vegeta, Luffy versus Kaido, Goku versus Frieza, Ed versus Father, Goku versus... You know, it'd probably be easier to make a list of Dragon Ball fights that aren't about this. In one way or another, almost every entry in this genre has tackled this question and found its own unique and interesting answers to it. But for my money, the most compelling exploration of the subject and the one that's done the most to help me personally cultivate my own inner strength is Mob Psycho 100. The story of a young boy with extraordinary, nigh unfathomable psychic power and the exceedingly ordinary fake psychic who teaches him how to use his words. Three years ago, when season two hit the air, Mob Psycho 100 cemented itself as my favorite anime of all time. And after seeing how expertly season three just stuck the landing with its adaptation of the finale, already one of the best arcs I've ever read in manga, I kinda doubt anything will ever top it. So before we start exploring all the great new anime of 2023, and one incredible title from 2022 that most of you missed thanks to Disney, I'd like to take stock of Mob Psycho's many strengths and examine in their totality the three most powerful words that Mob learns to use throughout the series. People can change. First, though, a word from our video Ibo, NordVPN. Master Shisho-sama? Hold it, Mabu-san. I'm battling the evil spirits attacking this client's computer. I don't sense any. Uh, of course you don't. The spirits aren't here. They're attacking remotely through the internet. That's why I'm installing a psychic barrier to stop them. NordVPN.com slash Mother's Basement. This is one of Reagan's special moves, where he downloads and installs NordVPN from his favorite YouTuber's referral link for an exclusive exclusive creator deal. Evil spirits can use the internet now? Yes, and they're quite devious. Some disguise themselves as seemingly ordinary ads and files, possessing your computer the second you click on them. But NordVPN's threat protection system blocks such ads from appearing at all and scans everything you download for, uh, evil energy. Other spirits hide in what seem like normal public Wi-Fi hubs, siphoning the spiritual force of your login credentials and credit card info should you choose to use them. Thankfully, the NordVPN barrier encrypts all data that passes through it, rendering such psychic attacks laughably ineffective, and all without compromising your connection speed. I had no idea such a powerful technique existed. That's not all it does, either. With the click of a button, NordVPN can trick any website into thinking you're in one of 60 different countries, allowing you to access geo-blocked content anywhere in the world and leave one-star reviews on rival psychic agencies without you know, forget that last part. Let me just show you how to use the technique. All you need to do is go to nordvpn.com slash mother's basement. And remember, if you're not satisfied for any reason, they offer a 30 day money back guarantee. Sasuga, Master Shisho-sama. I'll download it right away.
Like most every shonen protagonist, Shigeo Kageyama, mob to his friends on account of his resting background character face, is driven by a desire to grow stronger. Unlike most shonen protags, however, it's not to get better at hurting the bad people, but to stop himself from hurting anyone. Mob's an innately sensitive kid, see born with an overwhelming wealth of emotions that he can't always control, but lacking in the ability to understand the feelings of others. And since in the anime's psychic power system, emotions equal energy, mobs manifest as overwhelming psychic force, which he also can't always control, and which fail to impress the only person he's ever wanted to impress, his childhood friend Subomi. After injuring his little brother with an unchecked psychic out outburst against some older bullies, Mob began to fear his powers and started bottling up all those emotions, though of course he can't keep them in forever. The 100 in the title refers to what happens when a given emotion reaches 100% capacity within him, spilling out as psychic phenomena that he does actually have full control over for the most part, and often, ironically, ends up being really helpful to the people immediately around him but he just can't shake that fear. Because when the feelings he represses the deepest bubble to the surface, or he loses consciousness, a state the show labels as question mark percent, his power is at its most dangerous, and he has almost zero influence over it. Mob's goal in life is to gain the strength to change himself for the better so that he can control these outbursts, and to acquire skills beyond his one talent so he doesn't have to rely on those unreliable powers so much, and maybe someday he can be someone who does impress his crush. He wants, more than anything, to be like his younger brother Ritsu. Charismatic, empathetic, Pathetic, athletic, and academically gifted. A well-rounded person who can rise to any occasion and solve any problem that comes his way, powers or no. Ritsu, quite understandably, doesn't understand that at all, and wishes more than anything that he could have rad psychic powers like Onisan. Failing that, he wants to be someone his brother can open up to, but after hurting him so badly, Mob has always felt too guilty to burden his brother with his problems, so he's unable to give him that. This lack of communication almost sends Ritsu down a very dark path once his powers do finally awaken, but as he learns to express himself better, Mob is able to overcome the barrier between them and reforge their brotherly bond stronger than ever, making the both of them stronger as individuals at the same time. That's probably the single most important bond that Mob builds over the course of the series, but it's far from the only one. When the anime begins, he's basically alone at school, known to his classmates, if they know him at all, as the last second year member of the Going Home Club, something the slackers in the telepathy club try to exploit when they lose their fifth member and are in danger of losing their snack and board game space as well. But as he gains more confidence, other students are eventually drawn to Mob, some with the strength to help him grow, and others who lean on his inner strength to change themselves for the better. Mob Psycho 100's core theme, the reason behind its pacifistic outlook, and the three most powerful words that its hero ever learns to use, is people can change. No person in the anime's world is framed as truly worthless or irredeemable, because every last one of us has the capacity to change ourselves for the better and help make the world a slightly better place. That eventually includes even the members of the Telepathy Club, who are inspired by Mob to make the most of their youth and actually pursue their stated goal of seeking out espers and eventually making first contact with extraterrestrial life in instead of just wasting away eating snacks and playing games. Though not because he joins them, that would be both far too cliché and counter to his personal goals. But they do end up hanging around him a lot because the club that takes their room generously allows them to share it in exchange for taking care of their newest member, Mob, whenever he passes out during club activities. Which happens quite a lot, because the club in question is the Body Improvement Club, five of the most jacked, 
positive, life-affirming gym bros you'll ever have the pleasure to meet. Guys who push themselves to and past their limits every single day, not so they can beat other guys up or win at sports, but for the simple pleasure of being ever so slightly measurably better than they were last week. Which is exactly the kind of positive influence and support Mob needs. The training is hard for the kid, even harder, perhaps, than striking up a casual conversation while maintaining consistent eye contact. When he begins, he has the stamina of a geriatric hamster and muscles to match, but slowly, steadily, and surely, every single day, he runs a little bit farther, passes out a little bit later, eventually improving so much that he's only losing his breath when he falls over, not consciousness. Mob's daily dedication and strength of will eventually inspires a new member to join up, Oni Gawara, a violent delinquent with a surprisingly perfect attendance record who starts out trying to get the body improvement bros to beat up a rival middle school gang and ends up getting Mob in his first fight with another Esper as a result. But seeing how the whole club rushes to Mob's aid, while well, every one of his own classmates turns on him the second he's in trouble, convinces Onigawara that using his strength to hurt others ultimately only hurts himself, and he ends up fully embracing the club's creed. Some of Mob's classmates do gravitate toward our hero for more selfish reasons, like Mizato, a school newspaper reporter who desperately wants her school life to be more interesting, and sees Mob's powers as the quickest ticket to that. Constantly encouraging him to show them off so he can be popular, even though he knows that won't work, and also so he can enjoy the benefits of being worshipped by a cult. She only meets Mob in the first place because her insatiable desire for anything interesting to happen almost gets her brainwashed by a different, related cult, led by a megalomaniacal evil spirit with crazy hypnotic powers named Dimple. Which probably should have been a wake-up call for her in regards to curiosity and cats and whatnot, but after Mob rescues her and the cult's followers, who begin worshipping a poorly drawn effigy of him as Lord Psycho Helmet, the thought of what might happen if he reveals himself to them is just way too interesting for her to let go. She's not the only dubious pal he picks up from that gathering, either. Dimple, the evil spirit, also starts hanging around Shigio, hoping to to hitch his wagon to the young psychic's rising star so he can take another crack at his big dream of becoming a god to all of humanity. In many respects, Dimple is not a good guy. His plan is explicitly to use Mob for his own benefit, at first wanting to simply steal his powers. Though, as he gets to know the kid better, he develops a deep respect for his inner strength, and the plan shifts to teaming up to take over the world. Which Mob never falls for, of course. He's He's gullible, but not that gullible, frustrating Dimple to no end. Dimple also has his own genuine good points, though. Chief among them, unflinching honesty. Well, bluntness is probably a more apt term. He doesn't offer many words of encouragement to most people, but that means that you can believe the ones he does offer 100%. When he gasses Mob up and tells him that he has the potential to be great one day, he really means it, and sometimes that's exactly what our hero needs to motivate him. At the same time, when Mob has the wrong idea about something, Dimple is the one guy he can always count on to give it to him straight. For a bad guy, he's a surprisingly great friend in the end. But that honesty to a fault sets him in stark contrast to the most positive influence on Mob's life, his part-time boss and mentor in all matters psychic, Reagan Arataka, the world's most lovable pathological liar. A man who uses his uncanny knack for figuring out what people want to hear to tell them exactly what they need to hear. Which is exactly what he did for a young Mob when he came knocking at the door of spirits and such consultations a few years ago, looking for guidance on how to control his powers. Before even knowing that Mob's psychic abilities were real, thinking he was just helping an emotionally vulnerable kid get over his proto chuny delusions, Reagan offered Mob a piece of wisdom that would become the core of his entire worldview. Psychic powers make you different, but only in the same way that other normal human traits, like 
book smarts, a sense of humor, or body odor make every one of us different. Mob's not special for good or ill. He's just a normal person who happens to be psychic. Thus, he doesn't need to let his powers define him. He can be whoever he wants to be, do whatever he wants to do, and participate in society just like everyone else. Though, in Reagan's humble opinion, the best way to do that is to accept and understand himself, live positively, and strive to be kind. That said, he's careful to impress on Mob that his psychic abilities are a more dangerous trait than others, and that while he should have confidence in them, he needs to be careful with them and never use them to hurt other people. Everything Mob does, everything Mob is, and everything that Mob becomes flows from this one life-changing conversation. The first time Mob repeats that message in the show, Dimple comments that it suddenly loses a lot of its impact when you know it came from Reagan. But the more we get to know the self-proclaimed greatest psychic of the 21st century, the more apparent it becomes that it's not all talk. Reagan may not have been born with actual psychic or spiritual powers, but he does have an innate gift for psychoanalysis and rhetoric that allows him to convince damn near anyone of damn near anything. He's canonically never lost an argument, or a game of rock, paper, scissors for that matter, and as a shady fake psychic, he's in a perfect position to use those powers for evil. And yet, he never does. Far from it, his scam strategy mostly involves tricking the sort of gullible morons who'd come to a psychic for shoulder pain or anxiety into thinking massages and therapy are a form of exorcism, all the while charging a thoroughly reasonable hourly rate of 20 to 30 dollars compared to the hundred to a thousand they'd pay your average scam psychic to tell them, ah yeah, you're, you're totally haunted. Wanna buy some beads? And while in a world where ghosts and curses actually do exist, this business model does create some potential risks for the rare client who actually needs a psychic to save their lives, he's got Mob, and later Serizawa, to solve the problems he can't. Most admirably, Reagan never takes money from a client unless he feels like he and his team have actually earned it, even when it's quite a lot of money. He's certainly an opportunist who's always looking for a new way to make a quick buck and earn a bit of fame helping people, but the helping of the people always comes first, and he sincerely fears the corruptive influence of unearned wealth and power even more than being poor, alone, and unknown. And he fears those things quite a bit. With Mob, too, while he's absolutely willing to exploit the boy's talents for far less than they're worth, like any job creator, Reagan's also always there to listen when Mob has a problem, give him the best advice he can, and knowing how easy the boy is to manipulate, protect him from those who'd lead him astray. He dissuades Mob from joining the telepathy club, not just because it'll cut into his work hours, but because it's such an obvious waste of the kid's time. But he fully supports him joining the body improvement club instead. Instead, even though it'll probably demand more of that time because it's so obviously good for him. The only time Reagan gives Mob blatantly bad advice, warning him that the real friends he's started to make at school are probably just using him when actually they just want to hang out and do karaoke, it is partly motivated by him wanting Mob to stay on the job, but more than that, his words ring hollow because Mob is his only real friend, and as much as he wants to see the kid grow, the implication that he might have grown to the point that he doesn't need as much protection and guidance anymore scares Reagan. Because when Reagan says, I want to be somebody, what he really means is somebody others can count on. That said, the distance those poorly chosen words create between him and Mob ends up being good for the both of them, giving our hero a chance to see how capable he's become of growing on his own without relying on his master, and giving Reagan the chance to show himself just how much he's truly capable 
capable of on his own. But it also shows them why they still need each other. Reagan needs the strong and talented mob around to rein his own ego in and keep him from making stupid, widely televised mistakes. And Mob needs Reagan in his life because he's a genuinely good guy who always has his back, even if he's not always right. It's also a marker of how much stronger Mob's already become by that point in the series that he's the one to make that call, recognizing that their codependency was turning toxic. And just in time, too. Because while relying on Reagan to dress down the childish idiots of Claw's 7th Division was the only path to a peaceable solution in that conflict, when Claw HQ attacks, Mob is the only one with the proper perspective on power to set the evil organization's leaders straight. Unlike his subordinates, Toichiro Suzuki fully convinced himself that he's the most mature person in any given room, and Reagan couldn't have told him anything about being a real adult that his own ex-wife and son hadn't already. In a sly inversion of that first Claw arc, Reagan proves essential to the Esper Resistance's battle strategy, while Mob is the only one who can find the words to save everyone. But I'm getting way ahead of myself, and that's not the only clever inversion that we see in Mob Psycho 100. The whole story loosely follows a chiastic ring structure, where the events of its seven major arcs all mirror at least one other arc in some way. That is, if you break the events down chronologically as opposed to how they're presented, and count all of the flashbacks strewn throughout the series that lead to Mob meeting Reagan as part of that first arc. As a gag comic, the structure's a little wonky. We begin the story with Mob running away from the darkness within himself, losing the ability to express his emotions in the process, and end with him confronting that darkness to finally tell Subomi how he really feels, helped on both occasions by the guy of Reagan. The second and penultimate arcs both put Mob's various relationships to the test, using Dimple and his cults as a focal point to keep the narrative on track. Arcs 3 and 5 both pit Mob's friends and philosophy against Claw and their twisted ideology, and Arc 4, while it kind of stands alone as a culmination of the evil spirit side of the story, also mirrors the first and last arcs by showing us what Mob might have become if he came into his powers later in life, alone and surrounded by people who beat him down, instead of the wonderful support network that he's so lucky to have in real life. An experience that in the end instills him with a new moral principle every bit as vital as the ones he learned from his master. In circling this ring, Mob comes into conflict with, and ultimately overcomes four major antagonistic forces, becoming stronger with each victory. So, to fully understand his growth, through the rest of this video, we'll be exploring each one of those forces in the order they're quote-unquote defeated, starting with... While the light and breezy comedic atmosphere of the series paints the world immediately surrounding Mob as a rather pleasant place, this anime is under no illusions about how dark and cruel reality can really be, how rare it is to find the kind of loving friends and family Mob has. Long before Keiji Mogami makes this theme explicit by showing our hero what he might have become in a world without his friends or powers, we see many examples of bullying, delinquent violence, non-benevolent con artistry, and countless other ways, big and small, that weak people try to raise themselves up by bringing others down. But precisely because of that, the series argues time and again, even the smallest spark of genuine kindness amid that darkness can light a fire in someone that changes them forever and for the better. Mob's first kinda sorta girlfriend experience only happens because a gaggle of popular bitches dare their friend to ask him out after he embarrasses himself in the student council election. And they're hardly any nicer to that friend, belittling her and tearing up a novel that she spent months writing simply because 
her passion for the project makes them feel inadequate. Ironically, the boy she set out to bully is the only one who appreciates how incredible writing a novel in middle school really is, and she's so unused to hearing simple words of praise and encouragement that she assumes he's lying out of pity. But by the end of the episode, Mob shows her that he simply has the courage to speak his mind, simply and plainly, even if it means pushing back against peer pressure or social conventions. And he shows us, in the contrast between that scene and him freezing up in his student council speech at the start of the episode, that speaking up for others comes to him a lot more easily than speaking for himself as does using his Esper powers, which inspires Emmy not just to have more confidence in herself and her art, but also with some really great ideas for her next story. But obviously Mob can't save everyone, and many suffer alone through their whole lives in this cruel world. The evil spirits we see our heroes battle throughout the series are manifestations of that unfortunate reality, lingering regrets and resentments given form and power. Some simply died before their time in laughably unfortunate ways, like Ceiling Crasher or the Frozen Tofu Ghost, and spend their afterlives spreading the misery around by cursing people in really petty ways. Others, like Scent Ghoul, were malevolent losers even in life, and take death as an excuse to spend eternity indulging in their worst and most perverse impulses, even though, as Dimple later points out to expose an astral projecting stalker, ghosts don't even have libidos. It's the ultimate expression of how pathetic someone can become when they refuse to change. More dangerous are the spirits who claim dominion over a certain territory, like the Tunnel Thing from Episode 1, or Wriggle Wriggle out in the vegetable field at the start of Season 2, jealously killing anyone who dares to invade their space. This paranormal activity inevitably creates fear around the places these spirits haunt, and all the negative emotional energy being directed their way pools together as psychic power that they can then channel to do even more harm. As we see when Mob takes down the Kuchisake Ona, a real-world urban legend that's given many a real Japanese child very real nightmares over the years, when enough of our collective fear is poured toward a place or idea, that destructive power can manifest even without an evil spirit to channel it. Conversely, if a strong, benevolent spirit, like the father of the ghost family that those douchebag teenagers wanted Mob to exercise, occupies a haunted space, all of that accumulated power can be safely contained. That's not the only way such power can manifest, though, as Keiji Mogami unfortunately learned through his work as a spirit medium. While he initially enriched himself by selling his powers to the highest bidder, many of his employers were just using him for a fraction of his real worth, and over time the resulting resentment spilled out of him, making his own mother sick. To save her life, he started taking jobs as a psychic assassin, but that only deepened his own negativity while drawing grudges from his victims, making her sicker and sicker until she died. When he realized what he'd done, Mogami's whole outlook changed, and he began to correctly view the untouchable, corrupt assholes who rule over society as the real source of all the world's ills and evil, vowing to become a malevolent spirit himself and use his power to punish those who would harm others without consequence. His methods are horrific, and his victims' crimes often petty in comparison to their punishment, as so often happens when we take moral ideals to their absolute extremes. But what makes Mogami arguably Mob's most compelling antagonist is, unlike Claw and Dimple, he's actually kind of got a point. Mob is in the right in that all people have the potential to change if given the chance and a bit of kind encouragement, but as Mogami correctly points out, a lot of people simply won't ever change, no matter how nice anyone is to them, unless someone makes them. 
Minori Asagiri, a popular rich bitch who fears losing her position in society and thus bullies others to cover for her own weakness, is ultimately inspired to become a better person after seeing Mob fight so hard to save her, despite how horrible she was to him. But she and her father, whose first response to her being possessed before calling in the psychics was to just get even more abusive and controlling, would likely both have remained horrible, entitled people for the rest of their lives if not for that first taste of real hardship that Mogami inflicted upon them. Not all evils in this world can simply be killed with kindness, and while Mogami ultimately finds peace and moves on by embracing Mob's perspective that we need to trust other people to be good and accept that some of them simply won't for society to function at all, Mob likewise learns from him that being hard on people is sometimes necessary, both for their own good and that of the world. That said, even as he takes that lesson to his now slightly harder heart, Mob still rejects violence, instead choosing to emulate Master Reagan's approach of telling fucking idiots when they're being fucking idiots, finally overcoming his inability to confront others right in time to stop Toichiro Suzuki's bid to take over the world. Of course, in a sense, Mogami has always been a shadow mentor to Mob, since even before they met, Reagan based much of his own greatest psychic of the 21st century persona on the greatest psychic of the 20th. So it's fitting that this final teaching from the real deal is what finally completes his master's lessons. One thing that really impresses me about how this story explores the guiding principles granted by Mob's mentors is how his own experiences reinforce them and inform how he interprets them. The psychic accident where he hurt his brother already made him wary of using his powers around other people, and Tsubomi losing interest in those powers likewise showed him that they weren't the be-all and end-all. So when Reagan told him that like knives, psychic powers should never be pointed at other people, and that they're just another normal human trait, he was already primed for those messages to resonate. And his experiences since, fighting Teru and other arrogant psychics, reinforced the value of that lesson by showing us how people turn out when they use their powers without restraint and rely on them over all else. But Brilliantly, the ways that Mob's solo efforts repeatedly come up short in these conflicts also highlight where his ideals are lacking and prime him to accept Mogami's last lesson. His refusal to consciously fight Teru is a big part of what moves his self-proclaimed rival to change, but he doesn't actually stop fucking around until after he's knocked Mob out, at which point question mark percent Mob shows up to help him find out. And while Mob's respectful kowtowing to the other delinquent gangs whose asses all got kicked by Ritsu in their hunt for Shiro Tea Poison is admirable in a sense, it does basically fuck all to stop those big scary thugs from trying to hurt the both of them. It's only after Mob earns their respect by fending off an even bigger, scarier thug that they find the good sense to back down. Because of those experiences and the immediate danger his friends and family are in, Mob comes dangerously close to adopting Mogami's tactic for dealing with bad people, that is to say, cold-blooded murder, in the first Claw arc all of his own volition, which would no doubt have sent him down an even darker spiral of guilt and corruption than the one that just awakened Ritsu's powers, but Thankfully, Reagan is there to be the adult in the room and show every Esper present a better way. Telling fucking idiots when they're being fucking idiots. Speaking of... It's fitting that the series dovetails between exploring the juvenile might-makes-right attitude that fuels semi-organized middle school gang violence and the reveal of CLAW, a secret society of psychic supremacists scheming towards Sekai Seifuku, because when you break it down, the only real difference between the two is the delinquents know they're a bunch of stupid kids acting out. 
Claw is, in essence, a fascist organization, hell-bent on world domination based on the belief that they are innately superior to regular people, and thus all the rules society imposes upon them are a distortion of the natural order, robbing them of the innate specialness to which they feel entitled. But even though their powers are very real and quite dangerous, even though they do significant, lasting damage when they enact their grand plan, and indeed even manage to briefly take over a statistically significant geographical segment of the world, the anime never falters in portraying them for what they really are. LARPers. <laughs> A pathetic pack of crybabies who can't hold down jobs or maintain meaningful relationships and blame everyone but themselves for those problems. Using fear and violence in a vain effort to attain some hollow semblance of the respect they crave, yet are fundamentally incapable of earning from even a single real adult. Organizations like CLAW are made up of deeply unserious, immature people, and no matter how big, powerful, or even scary they get, that never changes, because never ever changing is the whole point. Toichiro Suzuki sells his followers the childish fantasy that they can simply force the rest of the world to change around them so they don't have to, which they all find so compelling because change is hard and scary, particularly the first step of admitting you're not as great as you think you are. Of course, that's not the only thing that drives the organization, at least not at the top. The rank and file may be content to share in their boss's delusions just to feel powerful for once in their miserable lives, but Claw's upper echelon, the ultimate five, are all a little more complex, though no less pitiable in their motivations. Well, except Hiroshi Shibata. He was just a dumb brute looking for a license to act like an animal who learned a harsh lesson about the difference between real strength and unearned power, but they all represent a realistic kind of guy who would be susceptible to falling for Claw's brand of bullshit in real life. Ryo Shimazaki, the teleporter, is a childish little shit who's never suffered or worked for anything in his life, and thus sees nothing wrong with destroying the lives of others for fun just because he can. This makes him exceedingly dangerous, but also surprisingly easy to beat in the end. He's one of those motherfuckers who's never been punched in the face before, and really just needs a good punch in the face to scare him straight. Nozomu Hattori, the techno-kineticist, is even more pathetic, a weasley little coward who can't do anything without some sort of machine between him and his enemies, and who folds the second he's confronted without backup from the allies who make him feel so big and tough. Your typical internet troll, basically. Toshiki Minigishi, the chlorokineticist, mirrors the attitude of Claw's leader, callously using the people and plants beneath him as tools while claiming he's totally okay with the boss using him in the same way. In reality, though, he's simply a person who lacks self-confidence and uses his position in Claw to reassure himself of his own value. So just seeing how Mob values the potential of his life and hearing his argument to Mogami Keiji about people needing to put faith in each other is enough to shatter those flimsy beliefs and replace them with something far more substantial. The same thing essentially happens to Kazuya Serizawa, though he was never really a true believer in the cause to begin with. Before joining Claw, he was pretty much exactly like Mob, a guy with lots of turbulent emotions swirling within him that only ever seemed to cause trouble when he let them out. But he's a version of Mob who never found a healthy outlet for those feelings or anyone he could really share them with, so when the pressure of holding it all in became too much to bear, he started holding himself in instead becoming a miserable, game-addicted shut-in until Toichiro Suzuki got his claws in him. The organization and its mission became Serizawa's sole lifeline out of that nightmare, the first place outside his room where he could ever be even sort of himself. 
which gave him just enough mental fortitude to desperately suppress every feeling of doubt he had over all the horrible things his comrades were doing. Which still wasn't enough to overcome his disgust watching Suzuki beat the shit out of his own son, and ultimately, all it took was Mob offering him a sincere hand of friendship to finally face and overcome those feelings he was so afraid of. If Serizawa is a dark counterpart to Mob, then Toichiro Suzuki is his evil Reagan embodying the polar opposite of the guiding philosophy that Mob's master made up on the spot the first time they met. He believes that power is the only thing that can make a person special, and as the world's most powerful esper that he knows of, that naturally makes him the most specialist person in the world, the protagonist of life, not just his, but everyone's, which he believes gives him the right to decide how the whole world's story should go. Suzuki understands, intellectually at least, that people need other people. If he didn't, he couldn't manipulate Serizawa so effectively, but he sees that as a weakness to be exploited in others and eliminated within himself. The great irony, of course, is that his own power, the ability to siphon and redistribute psychic energy, which he shares with Mob, is utterly reliant on other people to be effective. And when he tries to take all that power into himself, he simply doesn't have the strength to control it. Mob does, though, if only for a moment, and after overcoming his totally understandable blind rage at the stubborn fascist jackass, then his overwhelming sadness at the realization that he still lacks the emotional power to break through to him in a contest of ideals, he resolves to stay with him in his last moments anyway, doing what he can to contain the explosion of violence and save his friends. A show of selfless kindness that does finally prove to Suzuki that even he needs other people, reminding him of the family he so callously cast away. And ultimately, in conjunction with the chlorokinesis mechanics that Mob learned from Wriggle Wriggle at the start of the season, and some conveniently placed broccoli seeds, it saves him from himself. Though not from jail, where he definitely ought to stay for a good long while, both to atone for all the crimes he did, and to really think on what he learned from Mob. Because one good conversation definitely is not enough to fix everything wrong with his worldview. Even if it is laughably easy to refute, as Mob does when he points out to a trio of claw goons that they don't know how to make a bottle, or fix a window, or create anything of value, really. All they know how to do is destroy. They're inflexible fools, armed only with psionic hammers, convinced that all the world is one big nail. Perhaps the most damning indictment of Claw's ideology comes from its own name, Sume, derived from a profoundly stupid misreading of the Japanese proverb, no arutaka wa sume o kakusu, a capable hawk hides its claws. This little nugget of wisdom is meant to teach us that we are more likely to earn the respect of others and find ourselves in advantageous positions if we refrain from flaunting our talents and only reveal them when they're truly useful. Suzuki mistakes this advice for an order and responds, You can't tell me what to do! I'm the most capable hawk, and I'll scratch up anyone who says otherwise with these fucking awesome claws. It's clearly intended as a defiant statement of strength, but to anyone with even an ounce of real-life experience who's familiar with the proverb, it just comes off as a pathetic declaration of his own small-minded incompetence. Of course, Suzuki's not out to recruit people with a healthy, well-rounded perspective on the world, weaklings as he'd put it. He wants the kind of useful idiots and naive innocents who hear stuff like that and think, wow, so cool. So the cringy supervillain branding probably acts as a filter of sorts to keep the ranks pure. All told, Claw is a very apt satirical depiction of how these sorts of groups work in real life. 
Cults also target the desperate and lonely, but instead of doing so under the pretense of violently returning them to a rightful position of power, they offer an intoxicating false feeling of contentment and belonging in exchange for just a little bit of your time, just a little bit of your money, just a little pressure to convert your friends and family just every single day. Which doesn't seem so bad at first. Hell, to the members and sometimes even their families, it can seem like it's genuinely helpful. But only at first. Cults maintain their grip on people by slowly eroding their independence, denying them that addictive sense of belonging unless they follow the leader, pull in everyone they care about, and cut off anyone who won't get with the program. They convince people that they are changing, becoming more spiritually whole, all the while draining their real strength in order to feed the leader's growing power. Instead of dominating the outside world, cults dominate the inner worlds of their members first and foremost. And most insidiously, they do so using methods that sometimes even allow the cult leaders to sincerely believe they're doing good. That all the wealth and adoration is their just and righteous reward. While he does use hypnosis to sort of speed run through the brainwashing part of the cult indoctrination process, Dimple is the vehicle through which Mob Psycho 100 explores all of these ideas. And Mob's clashes with the two cults his self-proclaimed partner starts highlight exactly how our hero changes over the course of the series. Taking down Dimple's first cult, LOL, is, quite fittingly, a laughably simple job for Mob. And not just because the cult's basis, worship of Dimple's power to make anyone laugh no matter how they're really feeling, is relatively weak. Mob's innate inability to read the atmosphere renders him immune to the atmospheric pressure to conform to the cult's doctrine, shaking the already flimsy faith of its members. And because Dimple's ultimate goal is to become a new god to all of humanity, he can't just let that go and is forced to resort to violence, which Mob is way better at, so he loses. As Reagan points out, LOL was a group of people that only Mob as he is at the start of his character arc could have saved so easily. So it makes sense that after two entire seasons worth of character growth, when Dimple finally usurps Mob's position as Lord Psycho Helmet and takes back over the new cult founded by those people he saved, stopping him is a much more harrowing and challenging affair. And not just because God Dimple has beefed himself up to nearly Mob's level with a combination of the latent power he and Suzuki infused into the big broccoli and the emotional energy pooling into the space from everyone who was already worshipping it as the Divine Tree. By the end of the series, Mob has a much more developed sense of empathy. He's hardly fluent, but he can at least get the general gist of the atmosphere, which naturally makes him more susceptible to it. And what's more, that pressure's not just coming from a room full of strangers anymore, but his own friends and family, including Reagan eventually, and of course Dimple himself, who sincerely believes he's pursuing his dream of godhood in a way that benefits everyone, including his self-proclaimed partner. We never learn much about who Dimple was before he died, but it's safe to say that he didn't have much in the way of Nakama, since he honestly doesn't see any difference between the happiness that he bestows upon his followers with his powers and what people build for themselves and the people they love. He offers easy bliss, an end to all negative feelings, in exchange for just five minutes of worship a day, just enough to maintain his power. And why shouldn't he and his best buddy Mob get to enjoy all that power and glory in exchange for sedating the suffering masses? What he fails to realize is that, like any opiate, religious fervor has side effects. And as we see from Mob's perspective, they can be quite severe. The people under Psycho Helmet's brainwashing become pushy, manipulative, and fake, projecting a facade of bliss and righteousness that gives way to aggression with even the slightest pushback against their truth. Everything they care about, even their friends and family, becomes secondary to the cause. And while that's making them happy for now, the erosion of those bonds and loss of any direction beyond serving their new god will eventually tear apart society at its seams. 
We can already see the symbolic cracks forming in the city itself as the tree begins growing out of control, which Dimple is too high on his own hype to even notice. So it's clear to Mob that he needs to be stopped at any cost. And with Dimple channeling power equal to, maybe even greater than, Mob's own in a fight scene even more spectacular than the one where he and Suzuki were throwing skyscrapers at each other, it seems to the both of them that our hero will need to go all out and put everything he has into destroying his former friend for the sake of the world. But that's not what happens. Instead, as Mob's frustration and anger creeps closer and closer to 100%, and Dimple becomes increasingly frightened, desperate, frustrated, and defensive, the tension is broken, along with the buttons on Mob's blazer, with the reveal of a hideously tacky t-shirt that tasteless Teruki encouraged him to buy for way too much money. A shirt that all of Mob's other friends, even Reagan, were far too polite to criticize. But Dimple definitely doesn't share that flaw, not even in the face of potential psychic annihilation in retaliation for his rudeness. <laughs> But on hearing that insult, Mob doesn't get mad, he reconsiders what Dimple's been saying up to now, and realizes he wasn't trying to manipulate him. Dimple still wants what's best for his partner, and honestly believes that includes sharing the cult. I mean, Mob wants to be popular, and who's more popular than God? Dimple only went off on his own to pose as Psycho Helmet because he saw his friend getting really carried away with delusions of his own popularity and worried he was about to steal his dream out from under him. An understandable thing to think, considering how Mob pushed him away first simply because his honest criticisms were bruising the boy's engorged ego. So, flying in the face of Shonen Formula, Mob backs down first, releasing all his power and choosing to put his trust in his most honest-to-a-fault friend the way he probably should have from the beginning, only, you know, without starting the cult with him, that would have been a bad idea. It takes Dimple a second to return that trust and see it's not just a trick to make him lower his guard, but once he does, that small revelation sparks an epiphany. Though he's dreamed of having them his whole afterlife, the only thing Dimple's done with his godly powers that wasn't utterly boring was this clash with Mob. And their friendship has already given him all the fulfillment he thought he needed to become a god to find. So he too lets go, severing his connection to the power of the Divine Tree and releasing his hold on the people of Seasoning City so that they can both just go home. Unfortunately, it's not all his to relinquish anymore. As we learned in the battle with Kuchisake Ona, popular enough ideas have a power all their own in Mob Psycho 100's world. And without Dimple to channel it, that power takes on a mind of its own, fueled by the megalomaniacal fervor that Dimple has fostered in his followers. An overwhelming army of Psycho Helmets begins pouring out of the wood, it, broccoli work, slowly sapping the power back out of Dimple the same way he did to Mob in their battle. And with Mob having exhausted all of his psychic energy, Dimple's the only one left to stop it. So, with one last hypnotic suggestion, the formerly evil spirit sends his partner back on his own to disperse the cultists, then sacrifices himself to send the Divine Tree and Earth's new god along with it hurtling into space. Which is quite the touching, sad anime moment, but don't you worry, he'll be back before long. In this battle, neither Mob nor Dimple conquers the other. Instead, together, they're finally able to overcome the power of the atmosphere that has flummoxed our hero since the series began. And with that, Mob finally finds the strength to face the greatest foe of all in his quest for change himself. Like most every shonen love interest, Tsubomi Takane is pretty, popular, seemingly unattainable, and almost devoid of any discernible personality traits. Unlike most shonen love interests, however, that's not because she's lazily written to pander to a male power fantasy. 
She just doesn't put herself out there like that. Though that only becomes apparent to us when the story has reached its end, because despite being driven in everything he does by a desire to impress his crush, Mob hardly says two words to her over the course of the series. They used to talk all the time when they were younger, since she was the only kid in the neighborhood besides Ritsu who was comfortable around Mob and didn't treat him any different on account of his powers, but that also meant his powers couldn't hold her interest, and given that she was the kind of kid who'd just walk away in the middle of a game of hide-and-seek as soon as she got bored, that really did a number on his confidence. Then that one time she joined the other kids in telling him to read the atmosphere convinced Mob she didn't like him anymore, and he began believing that his powers were what pushed her away. From what little we see of Subomi before the finale, that doesn't seem to be the case. More than once she's shown watching out for Mob from a distance, commenting on how slick he was with Emmy, and almost cheering him on during the marathon, though he was too out of it to notice, so she didn't. She may not have those kind of feelings for him, but it's clear that she's rooting for Mob, probably because they have way more in common than he realizes. Tsubomi isn't particularly attuned to the feelings of others either, flatly refusing to go with the flow if it means compromising on her own values or interests, and feeling zero remorse over all the tears shed when she flatly refuses confession confessions from half the boys in school. Of course, unlike Mob, she's quite popular, in part owning to her unearned power of pretty privilege, but her friendships that we know of all appear to be exceedingly shallow. Tsubomi is someone who puts in the bare minimum effort to maintain her social position solely because life's easier that way, reading the atmosphere just enough to avoid causing offense or embarrassment. So when she told Mob to get a clue, she probably meant it as sincere, helpful advice and just mangled the message with her own poor communication skills. But regardless of her intent, that moment was the root of the emotional repression that gives rise to question mark percent mob, or as he calls himself, the true Shigeo Kageyama. Every urge mob pushes down to simply use his powers to get out of a jam, every feeling of pride in those powers that he dismisses as arrogance, every shred of doubt about how his friends and family really feel about him that he ignores, and every desire that he denies himself remains bottled up within him as a shadowy mass of raw psychic power. And as raw power tends to do in this world, it's taken on a mind of its own, one that sees Mob's kindly outward persona as little more than a facade and resents him deeply for spending so many years rejecting his true self. Though when it appears at earlier points in the series, when Mob either falls unconscious or under great stress, it always begrudgingly does what it can to help him with whatever his goals are at the time. That only changes in the final arc, and it changes for good reason. When he learns that Tsubomi will be moving away, Mob finally works up the strength to confess his deepest feelings, something the true Shigeo was probably very happy about. He picks out the perfect location for it, the park where they used to play, and formulates a solid plan with the help of the many friends he's made along the way, putting together a spiffy outfit and even a beautiful bouquet of flowers. Hours. But then, in an instant, he throws it all away, getting hit by a truck after having to lunge to save a distracted kid because he hesitated, just for an instant, to use his powers. This knocks him unconscious, unleashing inner Shigio, who, as always, is pissed. But this time, he's pissed at himself for letting his hang-ups get in the way of the one thing he wanted most, and refuses to give control back to Mob. Instead, he makes a beeline for Tsubomi, using his powers without restraint to literally blow away anything and anyone standing between them. Refusing to stop for any civilians that might be harmed, his rival Teru, or even the body improvement bros. This version of Shigio has no attachment to them, because Mobs never let them see and therefore accept that side of him. He does hold back with Ritsu. That is a bond that precedes his repression, after all, just like Tsubomi. But even after letting go of all the fear he had toward his older brother, along with the 
somewhat insulting assumption that this whole outburst was just because he got rejected, and reaching a 100% state of his own, not even Ritsu can break through the barrier he's put around himself. Within which, Shigeo begins to absorb Mob so he can fully assert himself as his true self and seek the acceptance he believes only Subomi can give him. It really seems like someone might need to stop him by force, and ironically, Toichiro Suzuki is the only one with the power to do so. But when faced with the choice of potentially destroying his own body to redirect all of Mob's pent-up power the same way the kid once did for him, the ex-leader of Claw chooses to keep living for his son and wife instead, showing real growth on his part, but sadly leaving our hero to fight himself alone. Not completely alone. Though. Of course, Reagan comes to Mob's rescue, fighting through the deadly maelstrom with all the strength in his normal, weak body to reach his young apprentice and offer advice, though his words ultimately fall on deaf ears. Remember, Shigeo contains every bit of doubt Mob's ever had about his master's lies, seeing him only as a fraud who stopped him from using his powers for his own sake so that he could exploit him. Eventually, despite his best efforts, even Reagan is blown away, and it seems as if Mob will be lost forever. But thanks to Dimple, told you he'd be back, the greatest psychic of the 21st century gets one more chance to set things right. And what he says finally stops Shigeo in his tracks, not by proving his doubts wrong, but by confirming them. Reagan at long last admits he's a liar, cops to his own weakness and ignorance, and apologizes profusely for misleading and using his student. And ironically, in admitting that he has no idea what Shigeo's going through, he reveals that he actually totally does. Reagan lies to himself and others to cover up everything about himself that he hates, in the exact same way that Mob bottled up his powers and feelings. But those lies and the truths they cover are still a part of Reagan, and without them, he wouldn't have bonded with Shigeo or grown the way that he has. In the same way that, as hard as he's tried to reject them, Mob's powers have helped to define his path through life and the bonds he's made along the way. Seeing Reagan accept that about himself finally gives Mob the strength to do the same. And perhaps more importantly, it helps Shigeo realize that he's already found the acceptance he craved from plenty of people besides Subomi. So when they reach the park where she's been patiently waiting, even in the middle of this big, crazy disaster, which shows how much she genuinely cares, and she tells him she's just never thought of him that way, Shigeo Mob Kageyama is okay. Again, in bold defiance of the shonen formula, instead of getting the girl as a prize for his self-actualizing Mob gets something far more valuable, self-acceptance, and with it, the strength to accept rejection. I mean, he cries about it a lot, anyone would, but not in front of her. Unlike all the other boys who confess to Subomi, he's got the restraint and consideration not to burden her with those feelings. And because of that, he's able to keep up a friendship with her even after she moves away, something she probably needs as much as he does, even if it's not quite in the same way, because Mob is quite possibly the only person who's ever seen her hidden side and still fully accepted her. Some fans take this as a sign that they'll get together one day, and who knows, maybe they will. But regardless of what happens, we walk away from the story knowing that all of our faves will be okay, because Mob has surrounded himself with good people who he can rely on and who rely on him in turn, and become someone with the strength to take on any challenge that comes his way powers or no. And the real power of Mob Psycho 100, I think, is how it leaves us feeling like we can do the same. It's a shonen battle anime where the little victories, like everyone finally remembering Reagan's birthday, count just as much as, if not more so, than the big ones. Where the mundane, everyday struggles and anxieties we all face take center stage alongside the big, scary monsters and evil secret organizations. Where quiet moments of kindness and inner strength get just as much love from the animators as the bit where the bad guy gets an entire city block dropped on his head, where no one is special 
Everyone is the protagonist of their own life, and we can all be what we want to be with a little hard work and a lot of support. Just like in real life, where I wanted to be a figurine, and now you have just a couple days left to pre-order it. Just a heads up if you're watching this video the day it premiered or the day after. But regardless of when it is, Thank you so much for watching me gush about and analyze my favorite anime of all time for... You know what? Just don't look at the timestamp. It's fine. And big thanks, of course, to NordVPN for sponsoring this huge passion project. I'm Jeff Thu, your average, unspecial protagonist, signing out from a better place than yesterday.